All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to tonight's live Deep Sky Tour. My name is Stephen Hummel, and I'm joined tonight by Saul Rivera. Hello, Saul. Hello. Uh, so uh, tonight we're going to be showing you some live images from this telescope here behind me. And I am located at McDonald Observatory. And McDonald Observatory is a research facility of the University of Texas at Austin. So I'm located in the little dome there at our uh, visitor center seen there. Uh, unfortunately, uh, due to the pandemic, we are temporarily closed uh, to the public. Um, that's probably why we're doing this program tonight, to still share the sky with y'all. Um, but uh, again, we're in far west Texas, and uh, we have, uh, it's, it's winter now, and we've recently had some snow. I thought that was kind of pretty. This is last weekend. We got about three inches of snow. Um, but we are well known for our uh, dark skies here at McDonald Observatory. Uh, we have some of the darkest skies of any major observatory in the world. Uh, we're very proud of that uh, that that title, and we uh, try to very hard to keep it dark here, um, because it's critical to uh, not only the research we do, but to programs like this, because we're going to be showing you some extremely faint objects uh, that would not be visible from a city. Um, so. Uh, We'll just have a quick peek at the weather tonight. Uh, tonight, uh, we do have clear skies, wonderful clear skies uh, as far as we can see. Um, it is a little chilly, 44, um, but what makes it feel a lot colder to me out here is the wind. We have some gusty winds. You may hear it every now and then in my microphone. Um, but yeah, we have, a, we have a great evening tonight. We've got some great objects lined up for you. Uh, and I'm going to turn it to Saul, if you'd like to say a few things. Yeah, so hello again. So kind of before we go more into the program, I want to let y'all know that we have moderators in the chat who are ready to answer any questions you might have. And if a question might need more detail or might be better on at another part of the program, the moderators, moderators will send it to us and we'll answer it either then or at the end of the program during a special Q&A session. Yeah, why don't you tell us more about the telescope, Stephen? Yeah, so tonight we'll be I'll be using our um, our tried and true telescope, the workhorse of uh, the visitor center, as I like to call it. Um, it's a 16 inch telescope. You can see it right here behind me. I'm using an infrared webcam, by the way, because it's totally dark in here. I need to keep it dark in the dome for the telescope. Um, but the telescope behind me, again, it's got an aperture of 16 inches. The wider the aperture, the more light it can gather and the better quality the brighter the image generally speaking uh, will be uh, it's a very high quality telescope you can buy ones that are uh, cheaper the same size but this one is, is very well suited uh, for photography and other other precision kind of applications uh, it's kind of overkill actually for what we're using it tonight um, but I'm using a color camera attached to the telescope. Uh, sometimes I use a monochrome camera for these programs. If you've tuned into previous ones, sometimes the views are black and white. Tonight, they're going to be in color. The color camera has the advantage of, of course, being in color. But the, and some of the things we're going to be looking at are quite colorful, but it is less sensitive. So it won't be, the images won't be as bright, won't be as detailed as with the, the monochrome camera, which we sometimes use. Uh, if you are a telescope nerd and you're curious about the specifics, in the description below is a list of all of the, uh, the camera specifics and the software we're using tonight. Um, but uh, tonight we're going to be talking about stellar death, uh, the many interesting ways stars age and die and the lives they live in between uh, birth and death. So, so why don't you introduce us to how stars sort of live their lives? Yeah. So kind of before we go more into how stars live their lives, let's talk a bit really quickly about what a star actually is. So a star, the actual definition is any massive self-luminous celestial body that shines by radiation derived from its internal energy source. That's basically the law of words for saying it's a big ball of gas with lots of energy being produced at center. And the way the stars produce this energy is through a process called nuclear fusion. At the star's core, atoms are fusing together to create heavier elements, which then releases huge amounts of energy, which gives the star its heat and, and light. So stars come in different sizes, different masses, and a star's mass can affect several features of it. One of the main things that one can notice with, uh, with your naked eye is its color. 
So here we have what we call an HR diagram or Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, a chart we use to, to kind of chart the stars and see our life path. So in astronomy, red is cold while blue is hot. Sounds kind of backwards, but think of when you light a match. The center of the match is blue while the tips are red. Here you see stars from the ranges of red to blue with their temperatures and their luminosity, how bright they are. The more massive the star is, the heavier elements it can fuse and the more energy it produces, making it hotter or making it bluer. And the mass of the star doesn't only affect its color and its temperature, but also it affects what happens when the star meets its end. So here we have another little chart of stars with kind of their whole life cycle. So with low mass stars, like our sun, like sun like star, sun -like star here, it will become what we call a red giant, then leave behind a planetary nebula. With more massive stars, they will go into a supernova, a huge explosion. And with even more massive stars, they'll turn into the famous, or depending how close you are to it, infamous black hole. And not all stars fit on this set path. Some stars break away from either of the diagrams. One of these type of stars are what we call wolf Rayet stars. So that's the way reason it's pronounced Rayet, it's because it's French. And these stars are extremely luminous and rare. So these stars, these stars release huge amounts of material and, and their late stage of stellar evolution. They shed off about 10 suns worth of mass every million years, which is a whole lot and very quick for a star. And they're extremely bright, about a million times brighter than the sun. As I said, stated, these stars are very rare. We only know of about 220 of them in our own galaxy. And there's est estimates between 1,000 to 2,000 of them, which out of billions of stars is very, very small number. And we're actually going to get to look at one of these. Uh, back to you, Stephen. Yeah, right. Yeah. So the first object we're going to look at was caused by a wolf ray star. Um, and it's known as NGC 6888, or it's nicknamed the Crescent Nebula. Uh, and we'll see why. It's located in the constellation of Cygnus, the swan here. Uh, Cygnus is usually associated with uh, summer or kind of fall, but uh, we're, we can still see it even though we're almost in winter, um, but it will be setting relatively soon. So the, we won't be able to see it in the sky uh, for too much longer, a few more weeks, and then it will get too low to look at. Um, but uh, it's kind of in the west-northwest at the moment for our, our location. Uh, but yeah, the uh, Crescent Nebula, as it's known, is pictured here. This is our live view here. Uh, so we have that wonderful reddish color, and this, again, this is a live uh, telescope view. Let me kind of adjust the colors a little bit. There we go. So the Crescent Nebula gets its name from that sort of nice crescent shape you see here. Let's full screen this. There we go. Um, and uh, it is caused by stellar winds from this particular star. And this is a wolf Rayet star. And again, they're quite rare. There's only a few of them in our galaxy. Um, and uh, this star is massive. It's about 40 times the mass of the sun. And you can get a hint of its temperature because of its bluish color. So as Saul said, hot stars are blue, cool stars are red or yellow, opposite of your faucet or your AC. So remember that. Um, but yeah, this is actually such a hot star that most of the light it emits is in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum, which our eyes and our camera aren't picking up so we don't actually see the bulk of the light it emits. Um, but uh, this is a massive star that has uh, is nearing the end of its life. And when stars like this one, most stars uh, reach the end stages of their life and they start to run low, low on fuel, they uh, puff up and they shed material. Um, so this star, about 250,000 years ago, shed material off into space. And the outer layers are... Um, cast off, leaving the more active layers below, the much hotter area of the star, exposed. And then 
all that heat and energy from that massive, incredibly hot star is illuminating the surrounding cloud and making it fluoresce. So if we look back at our live view, um, we can see the primary color here is red. And uh, that is from hydrogen. So this material was once part of the star. It was cast off into space and was just floated there for several, you know, 100,000 years. Uh, and now the heat and energy of that star in its late life is making it glow and fluoresce. And hydrogen fluoresces red. We're going to see that a bunch more. Um, and a deeper exposure, you would see another color. Uh, here is a previously taken image of the same object, much, much deeper, also wider field of view in this from this telescope. Uh, and you can see blue. And that blue is from oxygen that's being ionized. So uh, the red, again, is from hydrogen, the most abundant element in the universe. And the blue is from oxygen. Uh, and uh, that blue color, we're going to see that again also in some other objects tonight. So the fate of this star is that it will almost certainly go supernova uh, in a few more hundreds of thousands and millions of years. Um, big stars live fast and they die young. So it will explode most likely in a supernova, but not in our lifetimes. Uh, and it'll change dramatically and get a, even more dramatic than, uh, than it is today. Um, it's, again, actually, I say today, this is about 5,000 light years away. So we see it as it was roughly 5,000 years ago. Let's maybe increase the exposure a little bit. There we go, bring out a little more detail. Um, some people call this the Euro sign nebula. I guess you can kind of see the, the Euro sign. Maybe if, you're, if you are European, you'd recognize it. Um, all right, uh, but Saul, back to you. You talk a little bit about the fate of a star like this. Yeah, so as Stephen mentioned, these type of stars will go into what we call supernova. It will be a powerful and luminous explosion. So stars are about eight solar masses and higher experience usually go down this path. Before reaching the actual point of explosion, though, the stars will be fusing heavier and heavier elements. So the star will fuse hydrogen into helium. And uh, since it's more massive, it will go from helium to carbon, carbon to neon, neon to oxygen, oxygen to silicon, and finally to iron, which doesn't go any further than that. The star, there is enough, you could say, energy to fuse it properly to get elements heavier than iron. And while this fusion is going on, this nuclear fusion, there is a constant battle going on inside the star itself, a battle between gravity and internal pressure. Gravity wants to push the star inwards, while the pressure wants to push the star outwards. Once the star starts running out of its fuel, the gravity will begin to win and cause the star to collapse on itself. And that it ends up collapse, collapsing so quickly that it creates a massive shock wave that causes the other parts of the star to expand very quickly, as seen in this little simulation. So here we have a little star who's about to go going into supernova. And for reference, that light, that amount of energy is huge. If you held a hydrogen bomb to your eye and detonated it, it wouldn't be as bright as a supernova. And we're actually going to see some remnants of one of these supernovae, called known as the Eastern Veil Nebula. And you ready, Steven? Uh, yeah, I'm just about there. Uh, so yeah, we are going to look at uh, the Eastern Veil um, Nebula also known as NGC 6992, also located in Cygnus, so not too far from where we were pointing earlier. Uh, and this is actually a very large object, so we can only choose one little spot to look at at any given time. Um, but we are going to look at the eastern section. So this is our live view here. Uh, and we can see those colors are back. And I saw that there was a question uh, are the colors we see due to the star's temperature or the chemical composition? When we're talking about the color of a star, just a star, we are talking about the temperature. 
uh, the temperature is what is going to determine the color of a star. Um, it's it's uh, black body radiation, as, as a physicist would call it. Uh, the hotter it is, the more blue light, the more blue end of the spectrum it will emit. Uh, when we talk about uh, the gases and the, these nebulae, uh, the, it's fluorescing light. And so this is a very different uh, kind, of, um, kind, kind of process. It's, it's like a fluorescent light bulb. You can have a fluorescent light bulb that uh, is very blue, but it doesn't mean it's you know, several thousand degrees. Um, so so, so nebulae, we're, usually we mean the composition of star, we usually mean the temperature. Uh, uh, so, but yeah, this is the Veil Nebula, and you can kind of see why we call it the Veil Nebula. Uh, it is very thin and sort of veil-like, almost like a like a like a lattice or um, a lace structure, uh, and it's dominated by pink and blue. And just like with the Crescent Nebula, the pinkish red is hydrogen, and the bluish color is oxygen, ionized oxygen. Not that you could breathe it. There's not enough out there. And it's a, it's a kind of color, uh, it's a kind of emission of oxygen that's sometimes called a forbidden emission, uh, which is maybe a little bit out of date. Obviously, it does emit that color, but it's a kind of reaction that cannot occur in our atmosphere. It's a kind of reaction that only really occurs in uh, a va the vacuum or near vacuum of space. So that's why we don't really see oxygen glowing around us all the time. Even if it's energized, it wouldn't do it. Um, the, uh, let me just adjust the contrast a little bit. There we go. Ooh, it's quite windy now. Uh, we are looking into the wind, so I apologize if you hear some wind noise on my mic. Um, but uh, this is a shock wave from a supernova. So this supernova occurred about 10,000 to 20,000 years ago. There were people alive at the time, and they probably would have seen a very, very bright star in the sky if, they, if someone was alive during that time period. Uh, and over the past 10 to 20,000 years, that shockwave of the supernova has expanded outward and continues to expand and eventually will fade away. Um, but it's still, there's still quite a lot of energy here. Uh, as the shockwave is traveling through space, it's swept up material. Some of that material may have been from the original star, but most of the material was just already kind of floating out there in space. And it swept it all up, and it's heating it up and uh, kind of compressing it into the shock run. There's a lot of structure here. There's a lot of detail. And I have a little animation from data from the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, and this is false color, actually, to add more contrast. Uh, it's a different technique. but. Um, and the structure is all real, and it's just wonderfully intricate. Uh, there's so much detail in a not very large area in this example. Um, and as the shock front is expanding, it's, it's encountering different areas of dens different densities. It's interacting with itself and being reflected around. Uh, and so there's a lot of, um, a lot of, a lot of interesting things going on uh, in, in this relatively small area. Here's a deeper exposure in color. Um, I used to think that uh, when I saw pictures like this, that the color was fake or added or it was an artist's interpretation. Um, but this is the real color of this object. That, that's really what it looks like. If you were to view it with your eye in a telescope, however, you would not perceive the color. Uh, generally speaking, you would not see color in, in most of these deep sky objects with the human eye, in a, even in a very large telescope because our eyes are really quite poor at perceiving color at night. In fact, our night vision is essentially black and white. And during the day, our detailed vision is in color. So that, not to say that you, it, you would see it in color, but if it were very bright, then you would see it in color. Uh, but this is just a small section of the Veil Nebula. The entire thing is absolutely enormous. We're only looking at this little part up here. That's the Eastern Veil. And this is the Western Veil, and we have all this other things. This is called Pickering's Triangle. This is about 32, I'm sorry, 36 times the area of the full moon in the sky. 36 full moons in the sky. So it's really big. If it were brighter, you would not need a telescope at all to see it, if it just were a bit brighter. Some people argue that if you hold a certain kind of filter that only allows that blue light through, uh, then you can see it with the naked eye. If you hold it up to the sky and you have good vision, you can kind of catch a hint of it without any kind of magnification at all. It's just that big. So um, 
that's the Veil Nebula. And uh, let's go back. We'll take one last view at our uh, our live view here. And uh, there it is coming in live. Uh, I, I never get tired of this object because it's so big and so detailed. You can scan along it for hours and just find little bits, little knots of interesting stuff uh, all across it. It's just incredible. One of my one of my uh, uh, favorite objects to look at uh, with a large telescope under dark skies because you could just you could spend a whole night just exploring it. Okay, uh, Saul, back to you. Talk a little bit about what's next. Yeah. So before we do it, there is actually some questions that came in that relate to the veil that you might know the answer to, Stephen. From Eric Alleman, is a shockwave part is the shockwave particles or gravitational waves or both? So we do think that a supernova may generate gravitational waves. However, they've never been detected. Um, this is a more conventional, uh, just a, a shockwave, uh, basically, you know, like an explosion. Um, in space, it, it's there's not always a true vacuum. There is some material which a, a pressure wave can pass through. Um, and, that, and that's what we're seeing here. So th there, there are particles that are being swept up by an explosive outward force, um, basically a big bomb. Okay. And the next one from Abel Pena is how fast is the shockwave traveling at? That's a good question. Initially, it can be traveling at maybe 5 to 10% the speed of light. Uh, for the initial stages of a supernova. Uh, as it expands, it, it generally loses momentum. I, I, I did, this is still expanding. I don't recall off the top of my head exactly how fast, but I do know that over periods of years with, with sophisticated instruments, we can see the shock wave move. It is actually expanding off. Just You would not really notice it um, unless you kept checking back every few years because this is light years across. So it, it on the scale, it, it doesn't on our scale, it doesn't look like it's moving, even though it is actually moving quite fast. Okay, thank you. And actually, that's a pretty nice transition because I'm going to go into more details about the back to the supernova and the shock waves itself. So earlier, I had mentioned that stars can fuse up to iron. That's the heaviest element that can occur in the nuclear fusion. But when the supernova actually goes off and that shock wave. There's so much energy, materials moving so fast, the heavier elements, elements heavier than iron, can begin to form, gold being included. So with Christmas coming up, if you want to buy someone the stars, you can get something gold-related. And hey, and so it will be a very, very nice fitting gift. And with the kind of mentioning the elements created in the supernova, I actually have a really cool periodic table of the elements created by space. So I'm going to go ahead and full screen this so it'll be easier to see. So this periodic table is color coded. And from, from kind of pointing it out, because I do know the text might be a bit small for y'all, green is Big Bang Fusion, yellow is dying low mass stars, orange is exploding massive stars, pink is cosmic ray fission, Purple are merging neutron stars, and cyan are exploding white dwarfs. In each of these elements that have that color corresponds to where they were created. And also in reference, how much of that element can be found, or how much of those elements from that star, or star action, you could say, make up the human body. As you can see with exploding massive stars, about 73%, according to this chart, is can be found in our human body. 73% of the better, yeah, let me rephrase that. 73% of the elements in our body came from supernovae, exploding massive stars, which is really, really cool. And kind of goes back to the whole analogy of that we're star stuff. And that kind of brings up the question of, well, if we're made up so of so much of this, so much exploding star stuff, how often are supernovae? They must be pretty common, especially with a galaxy with billions of stars. Well, the reality is they aren't that common. They only, uh, supernovae in the Milky Way only occur about one to twice every century. 
But there are some other galaxies that occur a lot more frequently, such as the one we're going to look at next, the Fireworks Galaxy. And while Steven starts bringing that up, feel free to drop in the comments, how much do you, do you think is a lot of supernovae per century? Yeah, how, how much is a lot? That's, that's a good question. So, um, because we're going to talk about a galaxy that certainly we consider to have a lot of supernovae, uh, and that is the Fireworks Galaxy, or the NGC 6946. Uh, it's an object that's currently in the uh, northwest part of the sky near the constellation of Cepheus. Um, and uh, it is relatively cl close to the North Star. So it traces an arc such that it's ac it actually never really sets or goes below the horizon. But it will get pretty low. And it's getting low for this time of year, which is why we're doing it tonight. Because uh, in a few more months, it won't be in a good part of the sky. But uh, the fireworks galaxy is a very aptly nicknamed um, because it's got just a lot of supernovae. Uh, and in fact, it has one of the highest rates of supernovae explosions of any galaxy we know of. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Here is the live view. Uh, it is a faint galaxy for sure. Uh, and in fact, this is a um, considered to be a very challenging object to observe for an amateur astronomer. Uh, the reason being that uh, it's actually uh, viewed through some dust and gas of the Milky Way. Uh, because if we go back to our, our star chart here, um, where we're, we're looking, we're not very far off from the Milky Way in the sky, this dusty, cluttered region. So generally, when we look at other galaxies, we don't look in this area of the sky. Some astronomers even call this the zone of avoidan avoidance if they want to study galaxies, because our own galaxy sort of blocks the view. So we're kind of, it's kind of uh, near that. And so what we're looking th through essentially is gas and dust of the Milky Way, which dims down the galaxy significantly. So it's a really tough object to see uh, in an amateur telescope, although you can do it. Um, last time I looked at this object, uh, and I, that I remember anyway, it was uh, about uh, 2017. And in 2017, there was a supernova in the fireworks galaxy. And in fact, we think this galaxy has about 10 supernovae per century, which is a lot more than our Milky Way. Uh, our Milky Way has maybe one or two per century. I, I, we're actually kind of overdue. I hope we get a good one soon because it'd be cool to see that in the sky. Um, but uh, this one has a lot more. Why so many? Well, it's because that th this galaxy is a starburst galaxy. I don't say that just like the candy. Uh, it, it has a lot of stars forming at once. And you can uh, pick up those regions because they're mostly located in the spiral arms. You know, if I make this full screen here. Um, so over here, we've got a little blob. Uh, over here, we've got a little blob. Those are uh, star forming regions. And this galaxy, 23. 22 and a half million light years away. That's, that's fairly far, but we, we can see galaxies much further than that. Um, and there are so many stars forming uh, that uh, they're, they're all forming all at once in these giant groups that they, uh, they essentially, this galaxy is flooring the gas pedal. It is forming so many stars so quickly that it just can't keep this rate up forever. And when you form a lot of big stars, they, those big stars, they're not going to live all that long. They're, they're going to go supernovae. So this galaxy has a lot of supernovae because it has a lot of star formation. Uh, there's so much star formation that uh, it's giving birth to an absurd amount of very large, massive stars, which then explode. Uh, so that's... That makes a pretty interesting uh, galaxy to study. It's a fairly well-studied galaxy in astronomy. Um, but we're going to see some other examples uh, of a different galaxy undergoing a similar thing where it may actually be blowing itself apart. Uh, it's going so, uh, it's fusing so many, it's creating so many stars and using so much gas because it can't keep that rate up forever. Okay, uh, I do have another a deeper picture here of uh, the fireworks galaxy taken earlier this week. There it is. Um, so you can see those pinkish star forming regions a little better here. Um, you can also see the colors of some of these foreground stars. So all these stars are all stars in the Milky Way, are the galaxy we're in, uh, whereas everything within here is 23 million light years away. 
Um, but yeah, look at all the, those pink regions. We're going to see some regions like this in our own galaxy in a little bit as well. Okay, uh, Saul, I'm going to turn it back to you. Yeah. So the, with the fireworks galaxy, it's experiencing lots of supernovae, lots of exploding stars. But that's not the only way, the only thing that will happen when the star reaches its life, the end of its life. Stars like our sun will create what we call a planetary nebula. So these are called planetary, not because they have anything to do with planets, but because we thought that's what happened. When these nebulae were first found, astronomers thought planets form in them. We now know that isn't true, but the name stuck, which is kind of a common thing in astronomy. The way the planetary nebula is created is when a star is reaching the end of its life, it runs out of hydrogen and begins to fuse helium. Since helium is a heavier element, it will cause the star to grow as a fusion is going on. And it will turn, grow into what we call a red giant. Our sun will be a red giant in about 5 billion years. And when it does, it will grow past Mercury, Venus, Earth, even some people speculate it might even reach Mars. Then as a star runs out of fuel, it will begin to shrink little by little, pushing material away as it does. As can be seen in this simulation. So there we have the material kind of pushing away as the star as the star is slowly shrinking, letting it go out, still being ionized by the leftover core, which we call a white dwarf star. And this is what a planetary nebula is. As time goes on, the material will go further, further away, disperse a bit more, until eventually it will become almost invisible to our eyes, or the better yet, not as easily seen as as some of our targets, such as our next target, the no, nicknamed the Blue Snowball Nebula. Yeah, all right. So yeah, the Blue Snowball is a very fitting name. It's nice and cold this time of year. Uh, makes me think we did get some snow recently. Um, but its official name is NGC 7662. Uh, it's located, located pretty high up, uh, kind of near the constellation of Andromeda and near Pegasus. Uh, and here is the uh, live view here. So it's a very small object, but pretty bright. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an object that's uh, well viewed in uh, an amateur telescope uh, with high magnification. Um, so uh, one of the reasons why the, these objects you know, are called planetary nebulae and they, they were associated with planets is because they are, well, kind of small in the sky like planets, even if they aren't really related. But yeah, it's the fate of our sun to form an object like this. So uh, this is the fate of most stars. Um, where only a few stars go supernovae, only really big, really massive ones. And those massive ones are not all that common uh, on the grand scale of things. Smaller stars like our sun or smaller, maybe a little bigger, uh, are, are far more abundant and this is their ultimate end. And it's not an explosion. You know, it's, it's, it's not a detonation like a supernovae, which happens in just a matter of seconds. Uh, th this, this formation of a planetary nebula, the kind of expanding material, uh, is, is much slower. It takes a place over thousands of years, but you would not want to be in that nebula. Um, for a long time, it was actually thought that the planets could not survive the, this phase of a star's life. Well, actually, now though, that's not uh, not a hard, fast rule. Um, that we actually have discovered. Some astronomers at McDonald Observatory have discovered a planet orbiting a white dwarf star that remains. So the white dwarf is in there. That's the stellar core. And white dwarfs, uh, they're technically not stars. If you want to be be kind of pedantic about it, because as Saul said at the beginning, a star has fusion. It's fusing one element into another element, which generates heat and energy, and that's what's powering it. White dwarfs are not doing that. They uh, are basically just hunks of uh, matter that are really hot and very dense, about the size of the Earth, um, but much hotter than the sun, uh, maybe half the mass of the sun or more. 
So they're very dense, they're very hot, but they're not undergoing fusion, thus they're not technically stars, depending on how you define it. Uh, the color, the blue color, the kind of teal color is again oxygen. Um, it is ionizing oxygen in that cloud and making it glow, making it fluoresce. Uh, but this is actually such a bright object, I don't really have to do much to the image. If I, if I stretch the image a little more, you can kind of see there's actually a lot of other stars. We blow out the core, but um, I, you know, kind of gives you some context uh, if I zoom out just how small this thing is. Uh, and in fact, if I stretch the image more, you can actually see there's some little galaxies up there too. Um, those are in the neighborhood. I looked this up earlier, about 600 million light years out. And a really big little fuzzy galaxy up there. Um, so uh, yeah, you don't actually need a, a very large telescope in order to see this because it's so bright. If I decrease the brightness and kind of zoom back in and scroll down a little bit there, uh, that those lines will go away in a second. Um, they, uh, yeah, you can see it's pretty detailed. There's a lot of structure in this very small object. Um, but tonight, the conditions are pretty volatile in, in terms of weather. Uh, the winds tonight are pretty crazy. So here is a view from the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, there it is. Yeah. So uh, obviously a much sharper image. Um, and you can also see that pink is back. That pinkish red, yet again, is hydrogen. Uh, and again, most of the blue is oxygen. Although in this case, you may get some helium in there as well. Um, planetary nebulae like this one often have very intricate shapes. And the origins of their shapes are still not totally understood. Uh, they, they have a lot of different patterns, and a lot of different uh, intricate uh, details. But um, in general, the shape is formed from stellar winds. Just like uh, before, what we saw with the Crescent Nebula, that star, that very massive star was, was sweeping the area around it and sculpting it. Um, it's a similar story here, just on a much smaller scale. So the Crescent Nebula, which was formed by a star 30 or 40 times the size of this one, uh, was several light years across, maybe five, 10 light years across. Whereas this is about 1.6 light years across, which is big. I mean, our solar system would still just be a tiny little uh, area within here, um, but certainly much smaller than other things. And planetary nebulae like this one are generally very short-lived objects. Uh, they they last a few thousand years, maybe 10,000, 20,000 years before they continue to expand and fade away and become invisible. Um, but uh, despite that, they are, they're a lot more common than say supernova remnants because there's just a lot more of these stars. Um, okay, so uh, that is the blue snowball nebula. Oh, let's go back one last little glance at the live view here. There's that live view if I center it a little better. Very bright, very detailed though. If I, yeah, there we go. You can kind of see that it's got that ring to it. I think that's really interesting how it has that bright ring inside of it. And, and honestly, in an eyepiece of a telescope, it looks a lot like that. If the big telescope, you can see the color. You actually can see the color in this one because it's bright enough and because our eyes are sensitive to, uh, the, to blue light more than other colors. But all right, uh, Saul is going to talk a little bit about how we come up with these names, how we come up with all these numbers and, and such, and what all that means while I go to the next object. So back to you, Saul. Yeah, so many times we get asked the question, how does this object get its name? So I'm going to talk a bit about how they get the name both in the official sense and the other more convenient ways of naming them. So here I have three examples. NGC 6543, M51, and SN1054, or more, more famously known as the Cat's Eye Nebula, the Whirlpool Galaxy, and the Crab Nebula. So NGC stands for New General Catalog, and it's actually a catalog of deep sky objects that was create, compiled together in 1888 by John Lewis Emil Dreyer. The M and M51 stands for Messier, Charles Messier, who was a French astronomer from the late 1700s, who was a very avid comet hunter. He tried to see comets going across the sky that are paying a visit to the solar system. He and his colleagues kept on confusing some faint objects for comets. Then they observed them for a couple of nights, 
and then realize they were wrong. These weren't what they were looking for. So they decide to make a list of each thing in the sky they were confusing for a comet, which became known as the Messier objects. M51 was just the 51st object in this list. And then SN1054, the SN stands for supernova. And 1054 stands for the year it was discovered. So SN1054 was a supernova discovered in 1054. If more than one supernova was discovered in a year, you start adding capital letters at the end of the name. So if the Crab Nebula was, for example, the third object discovered that year, it will be called SN1054 capital C. Once more than 26 objects are discovered, you're out of the alphabet, you start all over again, but with lowercase letters. So 1054 AA, AB, AC, etc. So if you were to give a name to the 28th supernova discovered in the year 2020, it would be called SN2020 AB. Now, as for the more famous and e more name, most sorry about that. The the other names, the ones they are more famous for and a lot easier to remember, such as Cat's Eye, Whirlpool, and Crab. These usually get their names by how they look like. They thought the Cat's Eye Nebula looked like the Cat Eye. The Whirlpool Galaxy had a bit of that Whirlpool shape. The Crab Nebula requires a good bit more of imagination, which happens every now and then, and actually applies to our next object, nicknamed the Pac-Man Nebula, or the official name, NGC-281, New General Catalog Object 281. Yeah, <laughs> so yes, the uh, Pac-Man Nebula is our next object, and as I said, you're going to have to use some imagination to see Pac-Man in it. Uh, and in fact, on the scale of the image tonight, we're going to we're not really going to see much of the Pac-Man shape. Um, but it's located in the north. Uh, this is the constellation of Cassiopeia. You can probably find this lightning bolt pattern of stars very easily. Uh, they are quite distinctive. Um, it's located right up there. So uh, not too hard to find, but it is pretty faint and diffuse. Uh, it's an object that it looks a lot better in a camera than it does in the eyepiece of a telescope. Um, but here is the live view of the Pac-Man Nebula. And uh, it's, it's a, another relatively faint one, but you can kind of see that there is this reddish pinkish tone to the image, They're kind of pervading the image, and some bright stars in the middle. So let's full screen this really fast. So the Pac-Man Nebula is a star forming region. It's located about uh, 9,500 light years away, which is a, a, a fair distance for a, uh, a, a star forming region. There are a lot that are closer than that, um, but it's still within the arm of the Milky Way galaxy that we are in, still within the Perseus arm of the, of the Milky Way. Um, and it's got this pinkish color, again, from hydrogen, uh, due to the energy of this very massive star at the center. This is an O-class star. And if you tuned in last week when I talked about the Bubble Nebula, this is pretty similar in a lot of respects. We have a very massive star, very young, extremely hot, at least 10 times the mass of the sun. Uh, and it's uh, shining uh, with such intensity that it is causing the surrounding gas from which it was born to glow this pinkish color. Uh, and you can kind of see that there is this darker band of dust here as well as another blob right here. And within these darker blobs of gas and dust, that's where you expect active star formation. In order for uh, stars to form, they, ha they have to be, uh, the gas uh, cloud that from which they are born is, it has to be very cold and still and generally a relatively serene place. It has to get fairly dense as well. Um, so, uh, oftentimes, you find these little blobs called Bach globules, B-O-K, after the astronomer, uh, Bart Bach, uh, and he uh, researched these, but uh, they are these clumps of gas and dust that are collapsing down, and there's probably newborn stars forming within this little blob, uh, as well as perhaps on this larger, darker band here. 
Um, so on this scale, we don't really see the Pac-Man shape very well, but uh, I'll try to explain it. This is supposed to be Pac-Man's eye, and this is part of his mouth. And if we look at another wider picture that was previously taken, um, maybe you can see what I mean. So there's the bright star that we just saw. There's the shelf. There's that Bach globule. Uh, so this is supposed to be Pac-Man's mouth. Okay. There, here's the round area, and that's his eye. So if you kind of ignore everything over here, uh, and you use a lot of imagination, averted imagination, as some of my friends say, uh, you can kind of see a Pac-Man shape, but it's a stretch. So um, I, I'll just stick with NGC 281 for now until a, someone comes up with a better name. Because again, the, the, we only call the, these things names if enough people call them that and it sticks. There's, you know, there's no official nicknaming process. It's just, yeah, uh, whatever you call. I, I like that surrealist Pac-Man. Yes, that's, <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, Pac-Man by, um, yeah, surrealist painter or something. Um, so yes, yeah, so let's go back to the live view here. Uh, again, when we were looking at the fireworks galaxy, we were, we saw those little pink regions in the spiral arms. And if you were outside the Milky Way, looking at the Milky Way, this would have looked like one of those pinkish blobs uh, from a distance. That's that's it's the same kind of thing, just a lot closer up. And we're going to see much brighter and uh, much more detailed examples of this kind of thing later in the winter as uh, a lot of people's favorite constellation com comes up a little higher, Orion. Some of you are probably already familiar with what, what I'm referring to, but there are better examples of this we're going to see later on in the winter. Um, but again, this is a star forming region, but even though it's forming stars, that massive star, because it's so big and so bright and it's fusing so quickly, it's going to live a short life and it will probably explode in a supernova. And when it does, that may kill the chances of star formation nearby, or it may increase the chances of star formation further on as the shock wave clumps gas together enough that that, that becomes dense enough to form more stars. Uh, so supernovae, yes, they they are violent and they uh, symbolize death in astronomy, but they also are involved in creating more stars. And the elements that are produced in supernovae get recycled and form stars and planets and stuff. That's how we got here. Um, but we're going to go to one more object tonight. Um, so, Saul, I'm going to turn it back to you to, to introduce us to the sculptor group. Yeah. So our last object is another galaxy, and it's part of what we call the Sculptor Group. So the Sculptor Group is a nearby group of about 13 galaxies, lying about 12 million light years away from us. And here's just a few Im uh, images of just a couple of the galaxies in that group. And some there are several groups of galaxies just kind of throughout space. The Sculptor Group is one of the closest groups to our own group of galaxies, known as the Local Group, a group of about 80 plus galaxies that include the Milky Way, Triangulum Galaxy, and the Andromeda Galaxy. If you want to know more about it or get more info, you can look at last week's live stream. We went last week we went into a lot more into detail about galaxies themselves and the local group. And the Sculptor Galaxy was actually mentioned in Stardate uh, not that too far long ago. And while Steven gets the Sculptor Galaxy into view, he does need to do a lot more repositioning for this target. I'm going to go ahead and answer some questions. Let's see. Ooh, this is a fun one. From Jimmy Dune. Do you agree that the universe goes on forever in every direction? There can be no outer edge or border, and may be empty space or filled with stars and planets. So I actually don't think that space goes on forever. From what we've seen through simulations and other things, space does have an edge. A bit while back, well, a bit while in terms of like several decades ago, we did think that space would go on forever. But from how we see it now, it more likely does have an edge, but the edge is also kind of growing along with space. It isn't just like a set boundary that will keep everything encapsulated, but more anything move along with it. Another thing that kind of goes with the idea of space not being infinite 
is a fact that you look at the night sky and it's dark everywhere. So if space was infinite, there would be an infinite amount of stars between in the area you're looking at the night sky. So let's say you have just one small area looking at the night sky, completely dark. If there were an infinite amount of stars in there, which will occur if space was infinite, it wouldn't be dark. There would just be light there. They'd just be bright all around due to the infinite am amount of stars, infinite amount of light sources. Since that isn't the case and space is still pretty dark, that kind of factors in pretty well into the idea that space doesn't go on forever. If it will grow for forever, that's kind of a different thing, but honestly, I honestly don't know much enough to know the answer of that. And honestly, I don't think astronomers know the answer either of will space go on for infinity? Yeah, that's a good question. And it's something that a lot of people think about and it's hard to answer. Um, there is an observable limit um, because we can only look uh, and see things uh, far to so far in the universe, uh, which is about 46 billion light years out. Um, because there, the universe isn't old enough for light to have traveled from a more distant area. Um, so there is sort of the observable universe. It probably goes on beyond that, but we won't really know. And um, whether or not there is an edge or not, it, either way, it, it's, uh, it's, it's not really something that our brains, I think, can handle. If there is, if it is infinite, you know, that, that doesn't make much sense to me. And if there is an edge, that doesn't make much sense to me either. So well, <laughs> uh, both, both of them are pretty weird. Um, I, I personally think it's it's infinite, um, and there are different theorists for each uh, each camp whether or not it's uh, truly infinite as far as you go, or it um, there is an edge out there. But we we have we we probably won't ever really know just because of our our vantage point or in our time in the universe is such that we we can't. We've, there's no way to observe past the observable universe, even if it is out there. Yeah, and there's some really cool, kind of like adding on really quick, some really cool, really cool scenarios, whether if the universe is infinite or not. If it is infinite, then the chances of there being another exact copy of us and of Earth is very likely. Infinite possibilities within of one infinite universe. If the universe does have an edge, it's the question of what's past that edge? Maybe it's other universes. Maybe we're a universe within another universe. Either way, how it goes is still a really cool outcome of that kind of borders science fiction. Yeah, whatever whatever the answer is, it's, it's interesting. Um, <laughs> but uh, we're not going to look out to the edge of the observable universe tonight. Uh, we did look we did look at pretty far in the previous live stream at objects billions of light years away. But tonight we're going to look at a galaxy that is only about twelve million light years away. Million with an M, not B. Uh, it's the Sculptor Galaxy. It's in the constellation of Sculptor down here, hence the name. And uh, of course, it's part of the group, as Saul said, of, of, of galaxies out there. Um, sculpt, the Sculptor constellation, this patch of the sky, does not get very high up uh, in the, above the horizon from where we are. Um, and for most Northern Hemisphere observers, that's going to be the case. It'll, it rises in the, in the south southeast and it sets in the south southwest. So it traces out uh, just a small arc in the sky as the Earth rotates. Um, so this is the middle line in the sky. Uh, and again, this is a live view of the whole sky right now. That's Mars there. Uh, so we're going to look at the Sculptor Galaxy. It's one of the brightest galaxies in the sky. And in fact, it's so bright you can see it in binoculars without too much trouble. Um, but there it is live. That's the Sculptor Galaxy. It's pretty big as well. You know, I, I can't actually quite fit the entire thing in there. It's kind of a little bit cropped. We'll get, we'll get the best part anyway in there. Um, the Sculpture Galaxy is another starburst galaxy, just like uh, the Fireworks Galaxy. But it's a little further along. And uh, it, it has not only just a lot of star formation, but it's got a lot of very massive old stars that are nearing the end of their life. Um, in fact, it has a very high population of wolf Rayet stars, especially near the center. There, it's one of the highest concentrations of uh, wolf Rayet stars uh, in the kind of the local universe. We'll kind of adjust the colors a little more here and this kind of get them as accurate as possible. Um, but you can kind of see there are some pinkish uh, dots in there as well. 
some 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 signs of star formation. Um, but uh, the blue is another kind of indicator of star formation. If I kind of enhance the color a little more, um, it is sort of a bluish tinge, or maybe silvery. Some people call this the silver coin galaxy, um, and it is slightly tilted to, towards us, uh, just a bit. When we looked at the fireworks galaxy, it was more face on, uh, but now this time it's only at a slight inclination towards us, which makes its spiral structure har harder to appreciate. Um, but it is a spiral galaxy. It can kind of trace out a spiral arm there, and maybe and maybe another one over here as well. Uh, but there's also a lot of dust and gas. Um, but uh, in this case, the dust and gas has been heated up by so many uh, supernova explosions and such that uh, the star formation rate is uh, is beginning to decline, we think, in, in galaxy terms, um, that the, the, the starburst phase is, is just that. It's a phase that can't last all that long on, on cosmic timescales because it's the equivalent of flooring the gas pedal. It's used up its supplies of cold gas, uh, and now it's it's starting to run out of material to form new stars. Um, that's not to say the galaxy is is down and out for good, but it, it will mean it will probably subside um, uh, in, in terms of star formation. Um, but it is, again, a very bright galaxy. It's pretty big, as you can see, and it's a good target for an amateur telescope. But you have to kind of observe it right around now um, because if you're in the northern hemisphere, it's just not above the horizon very for all that long. And if you're further north, kind of more northern U.S., it'll be very difficult because it'll be even lower in the south along the along the horizon. Um, so again, that's the Sculptor Galaxy. Uh, I do have another uh, previously taken image. There we go. A little more detail, a little longer exposure, bring out those colors a little more, um, and you can kind of see uh, the, the bluish edges of the spiral arms a bit better too, of all those massive uh, stars in there. Um, but this is where we're going to wrap up uh, tonight's program. But we're going to take uh, some questions now. Uh, so if you've got some questions for us, be sure to send them our way. Our moderators will handle some of them, and uh, we'll handle as many as we can. But um, uh, Saul, if you you got a question picked out? Yep, I actually do. One came in from Amy Mora. My 11-year-old, Telly, hi, Telly, would like to ask if there's any evidence of aliens. So as of right now, sadly, there is no evidence, or you can say hard evidence, of there being life on other planets. Though from there on, have to add on to it, though, I personally think that alien life is pretty common. There are way too many stars, way too many planets for us to be the only one with life. But as of right now, we haven't really even gone far enough outside our own solar system or elsewhere to try to find that evidence. We're still slowly going on throughout it. There are several projects, such as one here at the observatory on the Hobby Everly Telescope with a instrument called HPF, the Habilo Zone Planet Finder. We try to find planets that are in what we call the Habilo Zone of a star, nicknamed the Goldilocks Zone. Not too hot, not too cold, just the right distance away from the planet for liquid water. Then once we narrow those down, we can start doing a bit more research of the chance of life being there. But it's going to take a good bit more to actually get that hard evidence of aliens and other planets. All right. So uh, Jimmy Dunn asks, can we see through black holes? Um, so not really, um, although with an asterisk. So a black hole... Um, which uh, sometimes are the results of very massive stars dying. What they leave behind is a black hole. When not Most don't, but the very most massive do. Um, they are areas where no light can escape, um, so or no, nothing can escape. So if something goes in, uh, it will not come out. Now, you can get into some weird theoretical physics and Hawking radiation, but it, well, let's not go into there. Uh, but uh, basically, if something goes in, it's not going to come out. Um, so uh, if you place, if it was like a, a black hole in here, or like in my the circle of my hands, uh, right, you couldn't see my face. Um, but the light from my face may be bent by the curvature of space and time 
around the black hole. And so what you get is this very distorted view of the object behind. If you look at, um, if you ever watch the movie Interstellar or just search for the scene where they show a black, uh, the black hole, uh, that was actually a pretty realistic um, uh, simulation of a black hole. Um, they, they often have uh, disks of material around them uh, kind of like the rings of Saturn, except we, the, in, the, in the case of the black hole, what's behind it is bent around it. So I wouldn't say we can see through it because anything that goes in, we will not see, uh, but we can see around it, in other words. We can kind of sheet space and time a bit and see around it. Um, yeah, you got another question, Saul? Yeah, I have one from John Celera. Are white dwarfs sort of like the smoldering wood of an old campfire? That actually is a very good analogy of how white dwarfs are, the remnants of the low mass stars. Though the one difference, though, with the smoldering fire, with smoldering wood of an old campfire, it goes out relatively soon. White dwarf stars, though, haven't really run out. They have some, we've seen white dwarfs almost as old as the universe itself, but billions of billions, 13 billion years old, and they're still going strong. There is a name for the white dwarfs once they eventually, eventually do run out of energy, but we haven't ever seen a white dwarf die in terms of running out of energy. White dwarfs can still die, though. If they are orbiting another star, a companion star, and are close enough to pull the material into it, once a white dwarf reaches 1.4 solar masses, it basically becomes, there's basically so much mass, the material around is moving so fast, that it basically self-destructs and goes into a crazy bright supernova. I do actually have an animation of that. Um, there's an another way a star can die, and I, I didn't do this uh, out of time, but... Um, that's okay. great. Thank you for reminding me, Saul. Um, so the way we determine distances to galaxies uh, is often related to a specific kind of supernova called a type 1a. And where it's where you have a white dwarf, like that ember of a star is, is the analogy, uh, which is close to or orbiting with a, another more a larger star, which is puffier, not nearly as dense. And it, it's gra the gravity, the denser area of the, of the white dwarf kind of siphons off material from the larger star. And as that material is added on top of the white dwarf, kind of like it's adding more material to the fire um, or, or maybe breathing uh, onto a, a, a almost like the embers of a star, it can burst back to life. So, but it doesn't just keep going again. It's not like CPR or brings it back. Uh, when more material is added onto the white dwarf, um, it, it, it essentially detonates. It's a thermonuclear explosion. Not all that dissimilar from a hydrogen bomb. Uh, and that is that creates a certain kind of supernova, which always explodes with uh, almost the same brightness, um, regardless of the conditions, because it, once it reaches that uh, 1.4 times mass of the sun limit, it detonates. Um, and so that makes them really useful to astronomers because astronomers look for these kinds of supernovae in other galaxies because they always explode with basically the same brightness. We just have to find them and measure how bright they appear to be. And from that, we can work out the distance. Um, and that's really important to cosmology and actually how we know galaxies are so many light years away um, because distance is really hard to work out unless you have something like that, which we call a, a standard candle in astronomy, something we know intrinsically how bright it should be. Therefore, we can work out the distance based on how bright it appears to be. Um, any other questions you got, Saul? Uh, yeah, one from Leah Kelly. My eight-year-old son, eight son, Liam, wants to know how, hello, Liam, wants to know how does a black hole die? So from what we know, black holes can eventually have end up shrinking, but uh, it, this happens extremely slow. For some black holes, that's it can take basically. So one of the ideas, once the universe kind of reaches its end, everything kind of fades away. Black holes will still be around; they just last that long. They will slowly lose their material and kind of like shrink and shrivel up and fade away. Would be a good example. But the amount of 
time that will take is just crazy. Some black holes could even be around for Google years, which is a natural number. Google is not like the search engine, spelled a little differently, is one followed by a hundred zeros. Some things that in a supermassive black hole that's massive enough could be alive for that long. Um, uh, one more question here I saw uh, from from uh, Carol Giblin. Did y'all raise a glass for Arecibo this week? I did. Yeah, yeah. Um, the loss of Arecibo uh, is really tragic, and um, it, it's really sad to lose such a su such a an important observatory and, and unique. Um, some of its capabilities just ha are not replicated anywhere else. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm really saddened by. By the loss of that facility, I hope they build something equivalent to it or replace it. And I, ho I hope they they reuse that space because I know how important it is um, to P Puerto Rico. Um, but I think we have time for just one more question. We're going a little long, um, but so if you want to do one more question, and then we'll, we'll call it a night. Oh, uh, let's see. Okay, here's one that's been asked a few times. So, might I'm not really sure what the context is uh, from. Wait, just had her. Yeah, from Wendy Mos. I'm hoping I'm saying this right. Moskalik, as well as John Berlinghoff. Where does dark matter fit in? Oh, wait. I, I chose on the. I, I clicked the wrong one. Sorry about that. I it don't know, by the way, to that question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but the question was where does dark matter fit in? And I'm guessing this is applying more to the galaxies themselves. Uh, is that to me or? Uh, I think to either of us. Oh, so I mean, I think so. Dark matter, um, you know, it, it's important to understand dark matter if you're studying galaxies and, and how they spin and how and how they're structured. Uh, in terms of what we've discussed tonight, I wouldn't say dark matter is all that relevant. Um, it, it has more to do with the the evolution of, of the, the general scale of galaxies and and how they. Um, how they relate and how they move relative to each other. So when we're talking about the sculptor group, um, there was definitely dark matter in the, the sculptor group as well. That's kind of keeping it together um, because the, ma the, the, what we see, the, what, the things that emit visible light, uh, that is only a small fraction of all the, the matter and energy in the universe. Um, but, uh, but dark matter kind of works on very big uh, and scales on a very long, uh, time scales as well. So um, it matters some, but uh, you know, it, not a great amount. If you want to learn more, we do we did do a live stream back in last spring uh, talking more about dark matter and and some of the evidence for it and some um, uh, some ways we can actually see it, it and some evidence for it actually even with, with that we can see in a telescope like this. So check that out. That was back. I think that was Galaxies Part Two back in April or May. Um, but I think that's all the time we have for this evening. So thank you so much uh, for joining us, everyone. Uh, and uh, I appreciate your time. Uh, and uh, this is Steven signing off. <laughs> Thanks for helping me out, Saul. And uh, also thank you to the moderators as well uh, for, for making this program work. Um, so good night, y'all. Thanks for joining us. Good night. <laughs>